a void made in my heart Peggotty takes David to visit her family in Yarmouth where David meets Peggotty's brother Mr Peggotty and his family After tea little Emily was sitting by my side upon the lowest and least of the lockers Mrs Peggotty was knitting on the opposite side of the fire Peggotty at her needlework was also at home Ham was trying to recollect a scheme of telling fortunes with the dirty cards. Mr. Peggotty was relaxing. I felt it was a time for conversation. Mr. Peggotty says I, "Did you give your son the name of Ham because you lived in a sort of ark?" Mr. Peggotty answered, "No, sir. I never give him no name." Who gave him that name then? said i putting question number 2 to mr peggotty why sir his father gave it to him said mr peggotty i thought you were his father my brother joe was his father said mr peggotty dead mr peggotty i hinted after a respectful pause drowned said mr peggotty I was so curious to know whether I was mistaken about his relationship to anybody else there that I asked him my next question. Little Emily, I said, glancing at her, she is your daughter, isn't she, Mr. Peggotty? No, sir. My brother-in-law Tom was her father. I couldn't help it. Dead, Mr. Peggotty? I hinted after another respectful silence. drowned said mr peggotty i felt the difficulty of resuming the subject but in order to get to the bottom of it asked another question haven't you any children mr peggotty no master i am a bachelor a bachelor i said astonished why who's that mr peggotty pointing to the person in the apron who was knitting That's Mrs. Gummidge," said Mr. Peggotty. "Gummidge, Mr. Peggotty." But at this point, my own peculiar Peggotty made such impressive motions to me to not to ask any more questions. Then, in the privacy of my own little cabin, she informed me that Ham and Emily were an orphan nephew and niece, whom my host had adopted in their childhood. and that mrs gummidge was the widow of his partner in a boat she said that he was a poor man but as good as gold and as true as steel the only subject on which he ever showed anger was this generosity of his and if anybody referred to it he struck the table with a heavy blow with his right hand almost as soon as the morning shone I was out with little Emily picking up stones upon the beach. You're quite a sailor, I suppose," I said to Emily. "No," replied Emily, shaking her head. "I'm afraid of the sea." "Afraid," I said, with a becoming air of boldness and looking very big at the mighty ocean. "I ain't." "Ah, but it's cruel," said Emily. I have seen it very cruel to some of our men. I have seen it tear a boat as big as a house all to pieces. I hope it wasn't the boat that that father was drowned in," said Emily. "No, not that one. I never see that boat." "Nor him?" I asked her. Little Emily shook her head. "Not to remember." After some silent moments she said Don't you think you are afraid of the sea now I said No and I added You don't seem to be either though you say you are for she was walking much too near the brink I'm not afraid in this way said little Emily but I wake when it blows and tremble to think of uncle Dan and Ham and believe i hear them crying out for help that's why i should like so much to be a lady
we made our way home to Mr. Peggotty's dwelling. At last the day came for going home. My agony of mind at leaving little Emily was piercing. We went arm in arm to the public house where the carrier put up, and I promised to write to her. We were greatly overcome at parting, and if ever in my life I have had a void made in my heart, I had one made that day.